Are you banking on your followers being biblically illiterate? <laughs> I had to smile at this question, hey. Um, obviously, a lot of sarcasm comes through with uh, a lot of the questions we receive, and particularly questions that we receive from Christians. There seems to be quite a lot of sarcasm present in the questions. Am I banking on my followers being biblically illiterate? Well, the first thing I'd probably like to do is uh, discuss the issue of sarcasm in questioning. According to the Bible, and maybe if I could use the Bible as some quotations, the person here is talking about being biblically literate. And obviously the person has a feeling that they are biblically literate themselves. And, uh, and therefore they feel that bibli biblical literacy is very, very important in anything that's being presented. Of course, I say quite frankly and openly and honestly in all of our seminars that we don't agree with the Bible being God's word. And so there is really no need for a person to be biblically literate in order to understand the different things that we are presenting to them. There was also no need in the first century for anybody to be biblically literate to understand what I was teaching them in the first century. And that's the case in both centuries. The, the need for literacy with the common word of the day that was agreed to be God's word is, is not important in understanding divine truth. And it's, not, and it's definitely not important when it comes to demonstrating love. But if we can just maybe go through some Bible verses talking about this particular attitude of sarcasm, and then I'm happy to answer the question more fully. So let's look firstly at uh, the Jesus of the Bible and his words as recorded in Matthew 22. And the verses I'm looking for here were the verses where he was asked the question, what is the great, greatest commandment? And in 22 verses 37 to uh, 39, he gave this answer. He said, love the Lord your God with, your, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, like it, love your neighbour as yourself. So, so the primary commandments of all of what has been written before Jesus came onto the earth in the first century, and I, it's very hard for me to talk about Jesus in the third person for the sake of people, because it was me who was <laughs> saying all of these things. Um, but when I was on in, in the first century, I could see the primary commandment that was required was to love. And love would be the guiding force of everything. And then there's another verse, if we look over in Matthew chapter 7, there's another verse that says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So what I was saying there was that this, per, this point of ethics. The point of ethics is, don't do to other people what you would not like to have done to you. Now this person here is being sarcastic with me. I'm pretty sure this person probably would not like to have people being sarcastic with them. So they have already broken that particular principle. So although they are biblically literate, they have already broken the principle that they say they are literate about. So just because a person has biblical literacy, it doesn't mean that they love. And it doesn't mean that they have any idea what love actually is, nor have any idea of what ethical treatment of another person is. Mm -hmm. Literacy doesn't guarantee understanding at the heart level. In the first century, there are, there are many people that I spoke to, obviously, and I spoke to Pharisees quite frequently. Many of the Pharisees had exactly the same attitude. They would come to me ask, asking sarcastic questions, demonstrating the, their lack of literacy when it came to understanding. So that they understood from an intellectual perspective. They were literate. They were well-educated. They, they knew what the Bible at that time, let's call it the Torah, which, which was the main thing that they understood, but also many of the prophets they had read, they read it as a point of holiness. They didn't read it for personal application. They read it for a point of holiness, a, a proof of their own holiness or worth. And as a result of that, they would read this material and then they would, then they would try to, of course, force the people to follow the material, even when they personally did not follow it themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and their, their literacy did not guarantee their honesty. It did not guarantee their truthfulness. It did not guarantee their love. It actually, in many cases, uh, assisted them to have a poor character because they uh, felt uh, you know, more important than others, that, that they had more worth than others. And as a result of that, they were very unloving people at the time. And this is what I find with many Christians who send me abusive emails, is that they can be very unloving 
while at the same time quoting a whole heap of Bible verses to me. Now, I don't feel inclined generally to answer a lot of these questions, mm -hmm. but I am going to point out to people their unloving behaviour. And I feel this is why it's very important for me to first focus with the answer of this question on the unloving behaviour. There's another scripture in 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 20, which talks about love. And it says, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Mm. Now, when I look at that verse, I go, OK, he is a person who's demonstrably asking a question, demonstrably not really asking a question, but making a sarcastic statement. They have no love for me at all. They're in fact, quite a lot of hatred and anger directed towards me in the question, uh, which is a demonstration that they do not practice those three verses that I've just read out. So even though they may be biblically literate, it hasn't helped them to mm. come to a proper understanding of the truth. It hasn't helped them become more loving. It hasn't helped them in any way, really. And in fact, according to their Jesus words, they're not even following their Jesus the Jesus of the first century that they say they believe in. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, those words are words that I did state, and uh, they're definitely not following the teachings that I gave them in the first century, let alone anything that I, I might teach now. So my suggestion to such people is stop asking sarcastic questions. Start looking at your sarcasm as a problem, as an issue of love or a lack of love, and start addressing the particular problems that you have with a lack of love. It's the lack of love that will determine how well your life will be lived on earth and how well you'll be received into the spirit world. Mm. If it is not what you know about the Bible that will help you. I have seen many people on earth who know lots and lots about the Bible. All through the dark ages, there were many murderers who were priests who knew everything about the Bible. And yet their lack of love demonstrated towards others was so blatantly obvious and by the time they passed, they were in such a dark condition, they're still in the hells today as a result of their dark condition and their actions. Being biblically literate didn't help them at all. But let's get to the question. Mm -hmm. The question is, do I expect my followers to be biblically illiterate? <laughs> now, no, I don't. I, in fact, I would prefer that any person who comes along to a seminar, and I don't feel that any person who comes along to a seminar is my follower, by the way, and in fact, I don't feel I have many followers at all at this point. And if people were copying my life and my lifestyle, at this point, I have not yet met another person on earth who's copying my life and my lifestyle. So I can't say honestly that there is anybody who is one, a person who is following me. Mm -hmm. There are many people who are try, trying or attempting to follow the teachings that we present in our seminars. And um, my feelings are that uh, I would love them all to be very biblically illiterate and very literate when it comes to the Koran and very literate when it came to any writings, scientific and religious on the planet. Because in, in that regard, you can understand where everybody around you is coming from. You can understand why they have the particular feelings they have, the particular emotions they have, what is driving their misunderstandings or, or, or their disbelief. And all these other things can be determined through understanding where, the, where a person is coming from. So I feel it's very, very important to actually understand where a person is coming from. And given that 1.4 billion people on the planet are Christian, it would, it would be very good if you cared about people that you would read up about on the Bible and find out about the Bible and look at, into the Bible as I've done for 20 years in this life and for a lot of my years of 2000 years mm -hmm. of life. It's very good for you to examine the Bible care, carefully and clearly because if you do, you'll have a very good way in which you can help other people but also understand them. Now, the fact that there is 33,000 Christian sects on this planet is an indication that every single Christian has a tendency to, to interpret the Bible in a different way. And my suggestion is, is that God is a clear being very, with very clear laws. And if, if a book can have 33,000 different types of people, of, of people and analysing it differently, and formulating a diff different religions as a basis of that analysis, then obviously it's not very clear book. And so my suggestion to people is examine it, but, but don't necessarily believe everything it says because 
if, if it can create 33,000 different sects, there's got to be something wrong. Yeah, and I suppose uh, what I feel underlying in this question is the implication that you are banking on pe people uh, not understanding the Bible so that you can in some way I exploit their ignorance by... Um, by claiming that I'm Jesus and their ignorance about, you know, the Bible and what the Bible says about Jesus, And that the way you live and what you teach is actually not... Uh, doesn't marry with what the Bible says yeah. you should be. And it certainly doesn't. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't make Do any claims that, that it does. Yeah. <laughs> there are certain things the Bible contains that I actually did say and that I do agree with. There are certain things the Bible contains that I definitely do not agree with. And, uh, and there are many errors in the Bible contained, added by people who wanted to add the errors. But even some of the errors came from the original writers. You know, they, many of them were not inspired of God as is claimed, but rather were inspired of spirits that they were you know, connecting to and prophesying with. And, uh, and many of these things are not completely accurate. And you cannot, you cannot expect them to be. I knew that in the first century just as much and even more, so I know it now. I have the advantage over many people with regard to examination of the Bible because my own personal life is included in the Bible inaccurately. <laughs> yeah. So therefore I know that it's not God's word. And so, uh, just to clarify, do you hide this belief from people who attend your seminars and do you discourage them from exploring the Bible? No, uh, I encourage them to explore the Bible, but I do not hide from people that I do not agree that the Bible is God's word. In fact, I, uh, I disagree quite strongly that the Bible is God's word. I do feel, however, a lot of other different things about the Bible, which we'll cover in different mm -hmm. questions. But, but uh, and I do have a deep love for the Bible for a lot of reasons. But but that doesn't mean that I agree with everything it says. And I never did. In the first century, I never agreed with everything it said either. <laughs> and anybody who thinks that I did um, doesn't, isn't honestly looking at the record. For example, in the, in the first century, um, it was co commonly claimed by the people of the day that I should not um, engage with spirits, you know, that I should not have any discussion with spirits. I often talk to spirits in the first century. There's records in the Bible of me talking to high spirits and spirits who are in a dark condition. So I completely ignored that directive that was in, the Levitic in Leviticus, in the Torah, that I had read, uh, because I knew it was written by people who did not understand what was actually going on. And the same applies with many other things I examined in the Bible. I watched my mother in the first century you know, apply the law in her day-to-day -day life when it comes to menstruation and, and after the birth of all of my brothers and sisters. And, you know, in the case of my mother, whenever she had a daughter, she had to have 66 days by herself after the birth of her daughter and because she was following Leviticus to the law. My father was a Pharisee or wanted to become a Pharisee at the time. And so, of course, he wanted her to follow the law as an example to everyone else. And as a result of that, for 66 days, she may remain pretty much in isolation in the sense that we couldn't touch her, we couldn't, she couldn't hold her children, she couldn't, yeah, everything would become, you know, any, anything that she did would become touched with her uncleanness. Mm -hmm. And I knew that this was wrong, you know, that this was a, this was a way of ostracising and removing women from uh, truth and also treating women badly. It was a way of men controlling women and treating women badly, I knew that. So I, I completely ignored that in my own dealings with women. Um, there are many women, and the Bible even records such, of who, who touched me while they were menstruating uh, in order to heal some particular problems that they had, you know, some women problems that they had. And, and so I was perfectly okay with that as well. So I have always, ignored unloving texts mm -hmm. in holy books my entire life, first century and now. <laughs> <laughs> so please, anybody who's listening to any of the seminars, don't expect me to uh, quote everything word for word from the Bible without there being some kind of critical analysis. Mm.